All right, so here we go. Limiting nutrients. This is being recorded right now. Limiting nutrients are simply the nutrients in the environment that limit growth. It could be limiting factors, right? Limiting factors could be the fact that our uh, your wolf population is dying off because there's a limitation of a food source, which would be your deer, right? That's a limiting factor. It's limiting the population growth. Limiting nutrients also deal with the growth of organisms, right? And limiting nutrients can be dealing with our primary productivity. Primary productivity is the pro productivity at our producer level. It's a lot. Very productive. When it's going slowly, it's not very productive, right? High productivity, low productivity. The limiting nutrients really focus on the biogeochemical cycle. The limiting nutrients really focus on phosphorus and nitrogen. Carbon dioxide is really not ever a limiting nutrient to plants. There's always plenty of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. However, nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil for absorption, those can be you know, in lower levels. Those, those can help limit plant growth. It sounds like a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. We don't want plants growing crazy. We want to have our ecosystem somewhat in check. And the nitrogen and phosphorus availability in the ecosystem helps to kind of keep plant growth in check. So that's what the nutrient is. Um, however, sometimes the balance of our ecosystems can get out of whack. Sometimes the amount of limiting nutrients increases dramatically and it's not really so limiting anymore. Uh, that process is known as eutrophication. And what you can get from it is something known as an algal bloom. An algal bloom is, is a big boost in uh, food and al algae growth. That's all it is. Um, this also could increase plant growth as well. So plant and algae kind of go together. Um, this could be a natural process. Uh, if you've ever been hiking in the woods, you come up upon kind of like this, you know, a fairly shallow pond in the middle of the woods. I'm not saying the park, I'm saying out in the woods. Do you think you want to drink water from that pond? Yes. No. They're usually pretty murky, right? There's a lot of mud, and they kind of smell sometimes because there's a lot of like decomposition going on. That pond is undergone eutrophication, and all that means is over the years, lots of trees have lost their leaves. Right? Lots of organisms have died off. Right? There's a lot of organic matter now in that pond. Right? That's where nitrogen and phosphorus come from. Fertilizer is basically just you know recycled food. That's all it is for the most part. Um, so eutrophication is is a natural process. It happens naturally, which is not a bad thing. However, there is a process known as artificial eutrophication. When we say artificial, we're basically talking man-made, caused by man, which is not a good thing for ecosystems. Um, one great example of this, we can start like, uh, ever, ever been to like a park around here, somewhere in Britain County, where there's a pond in the middle of the park. Yeah. You know, it's nice and spring, it's nice and fall, but you know, kind of like mid to late summer, all of a sudden that pond just starts getting covered with algae. You get like a green murky stuff. What's happening is artificial eutrophication. You're getting a huge algal bloom in that pond, probably because they're using fertilizer on the grass areas in the park. And that fertilizer is being washed into the pond and causing this big boom in algal growth. It's human interference. It's, it's human activity causing the eutrophication process. Now, what's causing it is an increase in nitrogen phosphorus. But the source is basically human made. It's fertilizer that we're putting in the environment. Now, there's a lot going on here. You need to make sure you pay attention. Yes. But why is it adding um, the nitrogen and phosphorus like um, a limiting nutrient? Nitrogen and phosphorus are the limiting nutrient. They're usually in lower levels. So therefore, there's not enough to really keep plants growing as fast as they want. However, when you add fertilizer, you add nitrogen and phosphorus, so therefore, it's no longer limiting the growth. There's more of it. And why is that happening? Um, we'll talk about that. Yes. It's, 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 it's an increase in organic matter in plants. It can happen naturally, or it can be artificial, man-made. Um, here's our pond.
Um, one last thing before we do, though. Latitude. Latitude affects biome distribution, right? The further I go north latitude, the biome shift. We go from kind of like tropical rainforest to deserts to kind of temperate to taiga to tundra. Or north, are you okay with that? All the water kind of add in there is altitude has the same effect. Uh, if, if you kind of go from the base of the really, really tall mountain, like go from the base up to the top of the mountain, you'll progress in a kind of different biome type setting. So if you go to like Colorado or you go to Alaska, you'll progress through kind of you know more more temperate forests, which will transition to more um, to more kind of taiga coniferous forests, which will transition to like above tree line. Everybody has been skiing out west, you get a the tree line, you get to more of a, of a hunter type, type of line. So I just want to add in there that just as latitude affects the dis, uh, distribution of ice, <laughs> altitude does seem like a question. Wait, so I think that the city of forest is considered higher than the Don't be confused with that in terms of latitude. It's not like that going latitude. What they're saying is at a certain level, you probably get an increase in precipitation. We're not going to try to trick you on that. Just realize that they kind of change. All right, here we go. Aquatic ecosystems. This is key. I will tell you the key slides that you need to know. I'm going to add in a lot of information that's kind of just FYI type stuff. Just kind of like we need to cover it, but I'm not really going to test you on it. Uh, so I will focus you. This is a new PowerPoint. This is a new PowerPoint. If you didn't open it up, you're going to open it up. This this concept is key. Oh, this will be on the test. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. That's a key thing. All right. We are talking about aquatic ecosystems. We're first going to kind of walk through the breakdown, and then we're really focus you in on what we need to know. Aquatic ecosystems. They are determined by the depth of the water, the flow of the water, the temperature of the water, and the chemistry of the water. Chemistry is like saying salt water versus fresh water. Salt uh, could be dissolved oxygen, could be nutrients. Right? All of these are what we talk about in chemistry. Right? So when we talk about aquatic ecosystems, these are the kind of characteristics we're, we're thinking about. Um, this is the, the great blue hole. I think it's in the leaves or off the of the leaves. Uh, it's a major dive spot. You can see how big it is. Pretty big boat coming out of the, the area. They can't people dying here all the time. It's a major dive spot. Oh, yeah. People dying to death. People dying there all the time. It's a great place to leave the wall. People die there all the time. so much fun. Uh, okay. So, according to ecosystems, we have, we have two major breakdowns. If you want to kind of create, we can, we can for the most part, Yeah. I mean, for the most part, fresh, fresh water. Uh, and then for the most part, fresh water gets broken down into flowing and standing water. Flowing and standing water. Uh, we're going to focus on fresh waters first, then we'll talk about salt water. So we're talking about fresh water ecosystems. Full of water ecosystems are rivers, <coughs> standing water, and lakes. We all know what a river and stream is, that the water moves through the streams, and then lakes get the Standing water just means it's not flowing. Okay, there's a lot here, but you don't need to copy all this down. The first couple lines will do it. The only thing we really need to know about flowing water ecosystems, about rivers and streams, is this.
mountain. River. At the top. High oxygen, low nutrients. That water is just falling from the rain. It's falling up from the spring. There's going to be a lot of dissolved oxygen in this water, right? You want to go get a fresh drink of water, you go to the top of the mountain and you drink from the tree. You want to die from drinking the water, you drink the water at the bottom. Right? Because what happens as water goes down, you get more and more nutrients, more and more sediments in there. You get more and more organisms using up this dissolved oxygen. So what happens as you move down the stream at the bottom, you tend to have lower O2, higher nutrients. Can you say like high O2 and lower O2? I'll say dissolved oxygen. How much oxygen is dissolved in the water? Now again, it doesn't mean like the Hudson River has no oxygen. It does. But if you go to like the source, the top is going to be higher dissolved oxygen. So just picture, as the river is moving downstream, it's going to pick up more sediment. It's going to get a little dirtier, a little murky, right? Those nutrients can support more and more uh, organisms living in the, in the river. So therefore, you're going to get more and more nutrients, less and less oxygen, right? You don't want to go drink the Hudson River down there. It's not a good thing. Yeah. That's not going to be that great. Right. So on this slide, that's all you really need. It is the concept of high, high oxygen, low nutrients at the beginning. It picks up sediment, it picks up, you get more and more organisms, right? Where do you see the most organisms? You go up to the top of the mountain. Is that river flowing with, with algae and with plants? No, it's fairly clean. It's kind of rocky. Right? Yeah. Okay, that's the first thing. Other thing with flowing water, that's the Kanika Vegas Highway. Uh, that's actually the Kanika Vegas River. Which the Kanika Vegas Highway runs along. Um, it's it's actually it's actually in uh, it's in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, where I used to go camping when I was little. Uh, it's kind of a fun place. Um, so it, it's just like a nice river, just kind of showing the face. So now the reason why I'm showing it is because the organisms living in flowing water ecosystems are well adapted for the environment. These are the larvae for mosquitoes. Hopefully, they don't carry Zika virus. They might these days, right? But anyway, you can see how these larvae, they're grabbing onto a blade of grass. That's a blade of grass right there. And they have these little hooks, so they don't go flowing down the river, so they can withstand the current. So they are adapted to the environment. There's a nice trout. Trout, they're good swimmers. They're streamlined. They're strong. They do well in flowing water ecosystems because they can keep going against the current. You have a large belt bass. And a big, kind of monkey. Not going to do so well in the rivers. They're going to get washed downstream. Or you think of like a sunfish or a sun. Right? The organisms that live in flowing water ecosystems, those fish are usually streamlined and strong swimmers. And they need to deal with the currents. Okay. That's really all you need for flowing water ecosystems. That's it. Really that concept of oxygen and nutrients. Yeah, the animal thing is kind of simple. Standing water. Standing water, this is where we start having algae as really the base, the producers for the ecosystem. And algae that undergo photosynthesis, we oftentimes call phytoplankton. So phytoplankton are plankton are little organisms, usually little algae organisms, uh, that can undergo photosynthesis. Phytoplankton are eaten by little zooplankton. Zooplankton are heterotrophs. So phytoplankton are the autotrophs. Zooplankton are the heterotrophs. They're like little microscopic organisms that eat phytoplankton. They make up the basis of the aquatic ecosystem. They're, they're, they're the producers of it. You think phytoplankton do well in rivers? No, they get washed down streams. They end up in lakes and ponds. That's where they, that's where they really make their, um, make their homes. Everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, standing water ecosystems. This is the image you need. So no one might have played the play that's key for the oceans and key for freshwater ecosystems. Really, we just need to know the zones of a lake or a pond. There is the littoral zone, the L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. So, 
That is the zone that is closest to the shore. Um, when you go swimming up on your lake, you're kind of swimming in the littoral zone. It's where you have the highest concentration of organisms, of plants that are growing, fish living there. The middle part of the lake is known as the pelagic zone. I kind of write them in case you can't see them. Pelagic zone and the littoral zone. Those are really the two main areas of our freshwater ecosystem. The last one is really kind of straightforward. There's a photic zone and the aphotic zone. Not all lakes and ponds have a photic zone because they're not deep enough. Right? It needs to be deep enough that light cannot penetrate. So you have like Lake Tahoe, 200 BC, that you might get down to a depth where light is not penetrating anymore. Um, so the photic zone is simply as deep as the light can penetrate, the aphotic zone is as deeper depth. Not only is it depth, it also deals with murkiness and you know, how much uh, material is actually in the water as well. Everyone okay? Yes. So the littoral zone is just kind of the area of the pond closer to the shore. The pelagic zone is really kind of the middle of the pond. Okay. Yeah, because it's closer to the shore. That's about your side, so it's the total zone that goes to the side. Okay. Uh, if it's just kind of the center part, you're, you're typically going to have less organisms in the pelagic zone um, because it's really not dealing with kind of the, the base of the pond and the bottom of the pond. Um, in the littoral zone is where you have the most organisms. Are we good? This is just FYI, you don't need to write anything down here. There are a lot of wetlands and freshwater wetlands. There are bogs, there are marshes, there are swamps. We know marshes. Marshes are what you see with like grasses on the side of a river or kind of like going off the side of a lake or mud. You don't need to write this down. Um, so we know marshes around here. We don't really have any bogs around here. I don't know if there are any bogs around here. We see them in like Northern Ireland and Scotland. It could be a swampy area, yeah, possibly. Um, a bog is really where you get a depression in the land. It's not necessarily near any water source, and it's almost like rainwater fills it up. And oftentimes it becomes very acidic. You think like the bog people in like Scotland, you heard of that? People like who fell into the bogs and the acidic, so it kind of like preserved their skin and weird stuff. Uh, thank you, bogs. So the last one is swamps. The swamp you think of the other. The swamps are basically flooded forests, a forest that's now filled with water. Uh, so slight differences. Marshes are characterized by tall grasses. I'm just kind of mentioning these, but you don't really need these. Um, however, we do need to know about estuaries. When I switch to an estuary, I'm switching from fresh water to salt water, right? Estuaries is 100% salt. What do we call the term? A little bit of fresh, a little bit of salt. Uh, it could be briny. I definitely did not spell that right. How do you actually spell it? Look it up real quick. Is it K or H? Is it right? I did? Uh, uh, well, I'm on my A. 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 Uh -huh. So brackish water, we're dealing with estuaries, we're dealing with brackish water. Estuaries. I personally like to call them the rainforest of the oceans. Why? Because there's a lot of productivity here. Right? Um, estuaries. This is what you see when you go down to the Jersey Shore. You see salt marshes. This is what you see by the meadowlands. The meadowlands are basically all estuary. Um, we don't really see mangrove swamps around here. Mangrove swamps are estuaries. You see a more tropical environment. Like down in Florida, that's where you see mangrove swamps. Um, the reason why we go to the rainforest is because there's a lot of nutrients. There's a lot of biomass. There's a lot of, um, of growth going on in, in estuaries. Well, no, no. I like to I made that up. But that's not, that's not a bad concept. I mean, there's a lot of proof. I'm basically saying it's very productive. Um, so we see things like this. You go down to the shore, 
as you get off the Garden State Parkway and start driving to the beach, you thought about a lot of this. This is what we see. These are salt marshes. Um, major fluctuations in tides. Uh, you get a lot of, um, you get, oh, low tide, you get that real kind of nasty smell. That's all like that detective. We call that dead decaying material that's being eaten food. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing for the heart. Because there's lots of nutrients in there for organisms to live um, and so forth. You smell it if you take the train, like Jersey Transit, where you have to do the metal to get it the wrong time and low tide. But it's good. Yeah. So you don't really need a map. So you just kind of know. I mean, I would know estuaries are more, you know, in temperate areas. That's it. Um, today, grass is more like kind of temperate areas, where it's where um, mangrove swamps are more southern areas. But we don't really plot these like we plot these. So we work on that. Um, mangrove swamps, right? We get these in Florida. We get mangrove trees. Mangrove trees and estuaries make a great place for their, their hatcheries, for baby fish to hang out. Why? Because big fish can't get in there. Right? Same with the estuaries, same with the salt marshes. It's hard for the larger predators to get in and out of salt marshes. So it's a good place for the little guys to live. Right? So so these are great um, great hatcheries, is what we call them. All right, we're going to finish right there, but I'll tell you a story. Yay. I did, yeah. But I went home, and the first thing I did to him yesterday was, was uh, creature report. And he yelled at me. He went, no! 